you. So we're going to continue working through our series here in the book of Acts. And if you'd like to turn with me, if if you haven't already, I'm going to be looking at the end of Acts chapter 18, and then we're going to be working through um, uh, verses 1 to 20 of chapter 19 today. Um, And so just to kind of recap what's been happening the last few weeks, we've been working through this book of Acts, and we've been specifically been looking at the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, right? So we've seen that so far he's gone on two missionary journeys. First he went with uh, Barnabas, it was Paul and Barnabas that went, and we see that they went to Cyprus, and then they went into the regions of Galatia, and we see that there were, um, there were successes, there were setbacks. Then we saw that they, they moved, and there was this Jerusalem council um, discussing um, the gospel itself and explaining how um, through the Holy Spirit and through believers coming together, we see that the gospel is proclaimed as it is we are saved by grace plus nothing. That is, we simply place our faith in Christ, and we can receive his grace and be saved. And then we see that there was some division between Paul and Barnabas because of John Mark. And so Paul ends up going up north for his second missionary journey, and he takes along with him Silas, and they meet Timothy, and then they go and they, they continue on to meet some of the churches on the opposite direction that they went on their first mission, uh, missionary journey, and we saw that they went to places that we are familiar with from some of the epistles in the New Testament, right? We see that uh, Philippi was mentioned. We see that Thessalonica was mentioned, that they also went to Berea and to Athens, and then what we finished on last week was the end of his second missionary journey where in chapter 18 he was in Corinth. And that's where we see First and Second Corinthians written to, right? Those churches there. So in that chapter or in the, the beginning of that chapter, we see that Paul emphasized something very specific. And that was Christ crucified, right? He was preaching the simple gospel message. And while he was there, he met these tent makers, which was um, Priscilla and Aquila, right? So this Jewish couple that has converted to Christianity, and and he meets them, and he's preaching the gospel there. And we see that he actually um, um, continues to convert many, many different people. And then he, at the end of it, had started heading back towards Syria, right? So he had gone back to Antioch. If you remember a while back, the church of Antioch is the church that sent him out on these missionary journeys. So he's now been sent out twice from the church of Antioch in Syria. And now what we're going to do is we're going to be kind of seeing one little section of what's happening as Paul's about to go on his third missionary journey. And then we're going to, in chapter 19, see him then on his third missionary journey, where now the focus is going to be on Ephesus. So Ephesus... um, if you know, that's where the book of Ephesians is written to, right? So that's why I love re- reading the book of Acts, because if you've heard now, you hear Galatia, you've heard um, Philippi, you've heard Thessalonica, you've heard Ephesus, you've hear, uh, heard Corinth. All of these are the letters that we see in the New Testament that he's writing to. So these are the people that he's encountering that he's writing to. So anyway, what we do is, as I said, before Paul, we focus in on chapter 19 with Paul, it switches to a man named Apollos. Now, Apollos, we haven't been introduced to before, but in the text, it it says in chapter 18, it says that um, Apollos, he's a a Jew who's from Alexandria. And so Alexandria, that would have been one of the places where like um, high intellect was valued. Like it was like one of the education centers of this world at the time. So um, he comes from Alexandria, and it says that he's very eloquent. He's very, very good at speaking, right? And he's very smart. He knows the, the Old Testament scriptures really, really well. And it says that he's preaching them in a mighty way, so with power, with, with authority, he's preaching. And it says that while Paul has gone back, right, so he had been in Antioch, it says that Priscilla and Aquila, who, once again, these were the tent makers that Paul had met already, and it says that they had come to Ephesus, And now they actually come to a synagogue, and they hear this man, Apollo, speaking. And so they're kind of like amazed, like, wow, there's this guy, he's preaching in the synagogues, and he's like on fire, and he knows a lot, and it even says that he knows some things about the way of the Lord. So that means he knew something about Jesus, um, but it doesn't say exactly what exactly he knew. But he was preaching the Old Testament scriptures, and he was even preaching a little bit of something to do with Jesus himself. But Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila, though they see that he um, is preaching accurately and powerfully, they see that there's a deficiency in his teaching and that he actually is missing some very important key components about who Christ is. 
So it was an incomplete message. And so what they do is they actually um, go to him in private and they, they, they set him aside and probably even invite him into their home. And it says that they instruct him in the ways of the Lord more accurately so that he would get a complete understanding of who Christ is and what he did through the crucifixion and through the resurrection and the ascension and then ultimately with the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost. So they, they, they instruct him and it says that whenever he heard this, he, he received this and then he applies it and he starts to go to all of these other regions in the synagogues and he's refuting the Jews powerfully teaching that Jesus is the Christ. And now as we move into 19, now uh, uh, Apollos, he actually now is going to Corinth. So and then this is when Paul is going to be getting in Ephesus. So you're going to kind of see they kind of are missing each other here, right? So now Paul has come all the way back from Antioch to Ephesus and that's about a thousand miles of travel. If you were to do the the, the the straight route, which he probably didn't because he went to other regions and stopped there on the way. So just you think how much Paul literally traveled. If you ever look at his missionary journey maps, you see how radical and committed this man was to preaching the gospel. But so Paul, he gets to Ephesus now, right? And so he's probably connecting with Priscilla and Aquila and some of his other people that he, he has met along the way. And on his journey, as he's um, arriving to Ephesus, it says that he encounters some disciples. And it's interesting, it doesn't say whose disciples they are. And, and some Christians have actually kind of disagreed on this, whether or not these are um, kind of these are Christian disciples who, who don't fully understand everything yet, or if these are John the Baptist's disciples, or disciples that have responded to the teaching of John the Baptist's disciples. So, but we don't know exactly, but what we do know is when Paul sees them and he hears that they say they believe, and once again, it doesn't say what they believe, so it could either be they believe in Jesus in some respect, or they believe in the, the Old Testament scriptures. But Paul clearly, like, um, like Priscilla and Aquila, they're noticing that there's a deficiency here, that there's something wrong with what they're saying they believe. And so he basically asked them, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because he, he knows that if you have the Holy Spirit, then you're, you're born again. So he, he's checking, he's asking, did you, did you, did you rec receive the Holy Spirit? And now what they do is they respond and say, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And so here, here is the problem. And so, and, and there's some debate once again on, did that mean that they had never heard that there was a Holy Spirit that existed, or did they not know that the Holy Spirit had come yet, that they hadn't heard that the Holy Spirit had come? So there's some merit for both sides of what they mean by that statement. But what, what Paul does then is he zeroes in and he, he, he asks, so then what were you baptized into? If you say that you believe, you say you're a disciple, but you don't have the Holy Spirit, what were you baptized into? And it says that we were baptized into John's baptism. So that means that John the Baptist. So, so somehow they, they were primarily focusing on John the Baptist's ministry. Like, if you notice, with Apollos, he also, it says that he only knew the baptism of John. So it seems that they are kind of still stuck. And if you remember at this time, we're in a very unique place in history because this is where we're seeing the Old Covenant being replaced by the new covenant, right? So we're seeing the John the Baptist, who really was the last Old Testament prophet, kind of preparing the way for Messiah, who was Jesus the Christ, right, coming on the scene and, and fulfilling all of this redemptive work. So we're seeing this transition and this, um, this um, thing going on where the disciples are trying to get the full information and get the gospel right. And so what he does, he basically explains in verse 4 of 19, he says that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That means it was to have you prepare yourselves for the coming of the Messiah. So the point was you're to repent so that you then can believe in the Savior. So you're, you're missing a key part there. And so what happens is it says they, they believe on Jesus, they believe the message when Paul preaches it, and then it says they were baptized. But then what's so interesting here, if you notice, it says they believe, they were baptized, but then Paul lays his hands on them, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is why I think it's so important that as we're reading the book of Acts, if you remember many, many sermons ago, I said narrative is not normative. We need to be careful here and not always try to pick out doctrine and apply it um, from every single little thing we see happening in the book of Acts. And here's why. Because we know that in Paul's letter to the Romans, he says that you do not belong to Christ unless you have the Holy Spirit. 
right? So he, he is teaching doctrine in the book of Romans. And we know that we are saved by grace through faith. So when we believe, we know that we are saved, redeemed, regenerated, have the Holy Spirit living within us. But at this moment, because, we, like I said, we're seeing a transition in history, we see that they already believed, they already were baptized, and they don't get the Holy Spirit until the laying on of hands. This is why I'm saying it's so important that we, we don't take doctrine necessarily always from what we're seeing in the narrative of the book of Acts. Because otherwise, you might think to yourself, oh, I'm not really saved. I don't have the Holy Spirit unless someone in the church authority comes and lays hands on me. So that means I could have believed I could have maybe even been baptized, and I still might not be saved. I still might not have the Holy Spirit. No, that's why I said Paul, he, he teaches in Romans that that's not the case. So these are unique cases that we're seeing here. These are not supposed to be the, um, the, the rule. Rather, it's the exception. It's the boundary cases as we see the church being born and spread out through the region. So they received the Holy Spirit, it says, and it says there were about 12 of them there. So we see 12 disciples that now are preaching and receiving Christ and now they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not only were they baptized in John now, but they were rebaptized, and they have the Holy Spirit. And then it says that they're able to do what we've seen in many other examples where they're actually able to speak in tongues. So we see that there's clear um, um, expressions of, of the tongues um, relating back to the fact that they had received the Spirit. And then once again, this is why we say narrative is not normative, because you might have received Christ and you might not have spoken in tongues. So you don't think that if you didn't do that, therefore you, you are not saved. Once again, it's if you believe on Christ and if you receive him, you know that you are redeemed, you are saved. So he then from there, it says that after he's met these disciples, he's preached the gospel to some of them, it says that he goes to the synagogue, which once again, that's pretty much what Paul would always do when he would go to a new region. He would go to their local synagogue. And there it says he preached for about three months so just imagine how long Paul has been on these journeys, right? Earlier, we already talked about how he had been 18 months in Corinth, right? Now, he comes to Ephesus, and he's been in the synagogue debating and preaching with the Jewish um, individuals there um, for three months. But it says over that three-month period, it says that the Jews had just hardened their hearts. They, they were not going to receive Christ as the, or Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. And so what it says is he basically he moves on like he had done in the past. And it says that he goes to um, the school of uh, Tyrannus or Tyrannus, right? Kind of looks like Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Um, you have this guy who had this school there, and he was allowing Paul actually to go and teach there. And so then it says that for another two years... Paul was teaching at this school so that people could be instructed in the way of the Lord. But it goes on and says, not only did Paul continue to teach during this time, and what were people being converted, but it actually goes on and it starts to show that Paul did miracles, actually. We don't always see Paul doing miracles, but here we see that it, it actually shows that he, in verse 11 of 19, it says, he worked unusual miracles, that God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. And it got so um, powerful and so amazing, some of the miracles that he was able to do, that it said that he had these, like, handkerchiefs. That would probably be, like, like sweat handkerchiefs, probably. And, like, aprons. And maybe that could have been, like, for whenever he was a tent maker. And maybe he had some things like that. But people would literally take or been, been given his handkerchiefs and his aprons. And it says when they would just go and touch somebody else who was afflicted, and it said either by sickness or by, like, demonic possession... It says that if they just would touch these things, it says they would be healed. They were healed, and it says that the demons were exercised from those individuals. So they were completely restored. They were completely healed by just the touching of these materials. And it says that um, because of this, and in, in Paul preaching the name of Jesus, they, they could see that Jesus was truly a powerful force. But what we see then is that there are some individuals who are known as these Jewish exorcists, right? And they basically heard about Paul preaching this name of Jesus and being able to do these amazing miracles. And so what they thought is, hey, we're going to use this Jesus name and we're going to show how powerful we can be, right? And it, specifically, it zeroes in on these sons of, uh, the seven sons of Siva or Skiva, however you would pronounce that. And, and these seven sons are some of these Jewish exorcists. And so what they do is they find this individual, this man who is demon possessed, and so what they do is they go in, and they're, you know, feeling pretty good and saying, hey, we're going to command you to come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul has been proclaiming. 
And what this demon-possessed man basically does is he looks at these seven sons and he says, Jesus I know. And Paul I'm familiar with. But who are you? Who do you think you are, basically? And then at that very moment, it says that the demon gives this man supernatural strength to where now he mauls all seven of these sons, wounds them, beats them very badly, and it says strips them of their clothes. So how humiliating is that? So they run out beaten, ashamed, and naked, running from this demon because they were absolutely powerless, right? But from that moment, we see that it wasn't a, a, a hindrance for the name of Jesus, Rather, at that moment, what they saw was when Paul preaches and genuinely follows the name of Jesus, the the Christ, and when we see that people that try to use the power and they aren't given the authority, we see that they are powerless. And so what it does is actually it magnifies the name of Christ in the land. Christ becomes magnified. That is, he becomes prominent, popular, famous in the region because Paul was faithful at proclaiming and showing who Christ is to this region. And because of that, it says that there are many who were sorcerers and magicians, and they actually end up burning a lot of their materials, their books, that would have probably incorporated sorcery and magic workings because they knew Jesus was the real thing. And it says that they actually burnt up to around 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of books. Now, books were not cheap, right? It's not something like you can buy $2, $5 on Amazon today. This is very expensive, very hard to get these books and materials, and you can't just have a printer that has them all. Literally, they're burning this. They're giving it to God because they want Christ to be magnified because they know that he is superior to to all of this. So as we see then the beginning in Ephesus of Paul's third missionary journey, what are some things that we can apply or take away from this text? Well, The the first thing that I want to draw your attention to and remind us of is that Christ makes us complete. I think this is one of the most beautiful things that we learn from the gospel and from scripture itself, is that in Christ, we are made complete. We are made whole. We are able to experience the fullness of life in abundance. And just think about this for a second. Who is Christ? That's the big question that we have on the table. That's the question that Paul has been preaching and debating through all of these missionary journeys. But as we know, Christ is the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the promised king. He is the one who conquered the grave. He is the one who rose from the dead, who, who saved the world of their sins, ascends it, ascended and is at the right hand of the Father. And when we think about truly who Christ is, we recognize that nothing needs to be added to Christ. Think about this. You cannot, what can you add to perfection? That is who Christ is. You can't add anything to the paradigm of perfection because he is the very fullness of God. And that's actually what we see in a couple of texts. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, so this is for in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we're seeing Christ has full divinity, and then it says bodily. So that, once again, we're seeing the incarnation being preached here. Jesus is truly God, and he's truly man. So in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then it says, and you, that is the church, are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So we're seeing here that Christ, he is the fullness of God. And in him, when we trust in him, when we place our faith in him, receive him as our Lord and our Savior, it says that you are made complete because you actually become a partaker of this divine nature. You get to be adopted into his family. You get to be indwelt by his spirit. Likewise, Ephesians 3.19, to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness 
of God. Think how beautiful that is. That is why we preach Christ. We preach Christ because in him we know that we can be made complete. That is why in Psalm 23 it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I want. I lack nothing. I shall not want. Why do we lack nothing? It's because we are complete in him. Some of you need to remind yourself of that truth just right there. I am complete in Christ. I am made whole in Christ. In fact, the word peace, which I've preached on a few times, the word shalom, that doesn't mean just I, there's no war. It means wholeness, completeness. He is putting all of our broken pieces back together. So through the gospel, through salvation, through redemption, we can be made complete. But for us to be made complete, once again, we need Christ. But when we are talking about Christ, we need to ensure that we get Jesus right. You can't just say any Christ or any Jesus because, as you know, there are many religions that have a view or a version of Jesus Christ that is deficient. It's inferior. Or maybe it's just completely wrong, right? So it's important that we get Jesus right. And in fact, in Romans 10, 1 to 4, we're reminded that the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, they had a very um, strong zeal for God. They were very religious, but they didn't get Jesus right. And that was the issue. Well, the reason we say that then is because in the text, we actually see two different examples in which they did not have a sufficient understanding of Christ. So without a sufficient understanding of Christ, we still are incomplete. So that's why we need to get Christ right so that we can ensure that we are complete. And in verses uh, 24 to 25 of chapter 18, we see Apollos. And in uh, chapter 19, verses 2 to 3, we see these 12 disciples, right? And it says that both of them, they only knew the baptism of John. This is, why, this is the issue here. As I said, um, Paul, Apollos, his message, it was not inaccurate. It was not even insincere, right? He was very sincere. Um, he even was teaching a lot of the, the right things from the Old Testament and maybe even knew something about Jesus as the Messiah, but it was incomplete. It's important that when we are preaching from our pulpits or when we are sharing the gospel with others that we are giving them the complete message, that they get the complete understanding of who Jesus Christ is and was. And that's why in verse 4, we see that the Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, verse 4 of chapter 19, we see the Apostle Paul explains to them John's baptism was a good thing. It was about repentance, right? It's about turning from your sin, getting your hearts and your minds right so that you are preparing the way, preparing to receive and believe in Jesus who is the Messiah that was to come. But it's so important that it's interesting because they heard John the Baptist teach or preach at some sort because they knew of his baptism. They, they knew of his ministry. But if you look at all four Gospels, and if you just look at John the Baptist, you would see that he has actually already been promising the things that Paul is preaching to them. And that's why he's saying, Jesus is the fulfillment here. You're missing a very important component. And so just look at Matthew 3.11. It says, this is uh, John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now that verse you can pretty much read in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So every time you go to John the Baptist's ministry, he's saying basically, hey, I'm giving you a baptism of repentance, but ultimately there's one who's going to come who's greater than me. He's the Messiah, and he's actually going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's actually going to give you the Spirit of God that will make you complete, right? So they are missing a very important part of the gospel, right? They're missing pretty much all of it if you think about it. They don't know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that he rose and conquered the grave, and they don't know that he ascended and then sent the helper, sent the advocate at Pentecost so that we can be with God forever. Now, that's a big deal, right? They're missing a huge part. And that's what, you know, 
Paul is probably trying to be like, make sure they get this right. Like, guys, they're missing a, a very, very important part here. So they knew the promises, but they didn't know about the fulfillment. So John the Baptist, he was, he was pointing them there, but they, they were missing the fulfillment, which was in Christ. And I think it's so important that we as Christians, we don't do what these disciples did right? It's great that they were passionate. It's great that they were zealous. In, uh, with Apollos, he was very eloquent and very intelligent, right? These are all great things. We should strive to be like that, but we have to ensure that we are preaching the full and complete gospel when we do it. You can be very good at speaking, very entertaining, but here's the thing. If you've been teaching or preaching and you don't get Jesus right, you don't get the gospel in there, then you're not finished, not, you're not finished speaking, Jesus is the reason that we come. Jesus is the reason that we preach and teach. And so we need to make sure that we get the gospel. Otherwise, it's like Apollos. You're, you're, you're living in the Old Testament here. You need all of it. You need the Jesus aspect here. And I think that sometimes even Christians on the street get this part wrong. Some of them, I think, are living literally in the days of John the Baptist. Because so many times when you ask someone on the street, well, how do you know that you're saved? Or how do you know that you're going to heaven? And you say, well, I've repented. I've, I've turned from my sin and I've asked God for forgiveness and God gives me forgiveness. Is that the gospel message? No, it's not. It is not repent, God's going to forgive you, and you're all good. Because put that in a court of law real quick. And some of you are maybe not understanding what, what I'm saying here. But go into a court of law and now you have the judge and you say to the judge, judge, I am sorry. I have changed my ways Will you forgive me? What type of judge, let's say you murdered somebody and that's, that, that's your case. What do you think a good judge is going to say? You're guilty. You're not getting forgiven. This is why we need Christ. See, repentance, asking forgiveness is nothing without Christ coming and paying the fine. See, Christ takes the punishment. Christ takes the fine for us so that we can be saved. So that is what Paul is saying in verse 4. He's saying repentance is good, it's pivotal, it's a part of the gospel, but it's repentance and then belief unto the one who has redeemed, the one who has died for the sins of the world. So it's not just, I said I'm sorry, it's you also have to trust in Jesus. So it's important that we get the whole gospel in there, and we don't just say God is love, God is gracious, God is merciful, I ask for forgiveness. We have to say God is wrath, God punishes sin, and Jesus took it for us. We need it all. We need the complete message to get Christ right, which makes us, once again, complete. Because these disciples, when they heard this message, it says they were given the Holy Spirit. At that moment, we see that they were made complete. They were made whole and they rejoiced with, with speaking of tongues, with celebration, with worship. They rejoiced when God made them complete. So that's one thing I think we need to recognize that Christ is the one who makes us complete and without him we are incomplete. The next thing I think we see is that we are to listen to instruction. That is we are to be open to correction. And I know sometimes we don't like this very much. You know, but, but there are so many different scriptures that we see through the Bible that give us this command to, to be open to correction, open to instruction. Proverbs 8, 33, it says, Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain it. So what is that? If, if you want to be wise, you need to be able to hear instruction. And then Proverbs 9, 8 to 9 do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. And teach a just man, and he will increase in his learning. Now see, verses like that are the verses that I'm reading in my private devotion time, and my heart is leaping for joy and saying, yes, amen, absolutely, I want to be more and more like that. But then there are so many times in the practical world when the minute someone is instructing or correcting me that I really don't like it very much. And I'm not saying amen to it anymore. And I think sometimes we can get like that. And maybe it's just me. Maybe you just need to pray for me. And maybe you're all perfect out there. But I think that it's important that we recognize that we don't have it all together. We don't have all of the answers. And we actually need instruction and correction. In fact, if you look at 2 Timothy 3.16, that's what Scripture's all for. The reason that we come and we, we, we study the word, it's not because Zach is so smart. 
No, it's because I'm trying to make sure that we continue to look at God's word because God's word says that it equips us and it corrects us and it instructs us in righteousness. That's why we open the word. If it was Zach just coming up here and talking all for 30 minutes and it has nothing to do with God's word, well, then throw me out and throw, throw whatever I'm giving you out. But we need to be open. If it's truly biblical, we need to be open for correction and instruction. Right? I think there's a lot of ministers that fail at this point. And like I said, I can struggle with it at times myself. And I think what it does is it severely limits their ministry. If you're not going to be open to correction and instruction, then you're going to be very limited. You're not going to be able to do very much with, with what you have. So we have to learn from one another. And we need to make sure that we as disciples are perpetual students. That means you always are constantly learning, reforming your thinking, renewing your mind, right? You're constantly learning and trying to study God, being the best disciple of Christ you can be. And I think, once again, we see in the text, that's exactly what Apollos, I think, does. I think Apollos was a humble, uh, was humble and teachable. Think about this. Apollos, he was like the hot thing at the time. I mean, he was literally probably the, one of the smartest guys in the room. He, he had the scriptures in the Old Testament down, and so many people were just moved by how mighty and how powerful he was in his speaking, right, in his rhetoric. But we see that Priscilla and Aquila come, and they actually correct him and instruct him, and he's open to it. He actually receives the message, and then he applies it, and it says that he is able to do amazing things things in his ministry. So I think that we would be foolish not to be open to what the Bible commands us to, which is open to correction, open to instruction. Now, it's important that we test all things. Don't just listen to every single person that comes and gives you a word, because guess what? A lot of people are also wrong, right? So you don't just listen to everybody that has a, an opinion, but you should be open and try to hear them at their best. Try to hear what they are truly saying and what they truly mean. And, and I also think it's important that on the flip side, and if you're that person who is going to correct or instruct, that you do it like Priscilla and Aquila here. Now, they didn't wait, or they didn't, during the synagogue or during the service, stand up and say, hey, Apollos, you're really wrong on something, or you're missing a big part. They didn't do that. No, it says that they, they probably waited. They probably even thought he was great in a lot of ways. And they said, hey, could we have you over for dinner? Can we have you over to our house? It says they went aside, and some texts actually might even say that they, they took them to, to um, their home. And, and they, they probably provided hospitality. They, they got to know them a little bit more, and then they, they shared the message. By the way, this is man and woman here. So that means brothers and sisters can correct anyone in the church. That means if you're in leadership, if you're the preacher. Now, but it's supposed to be done in this way, in humility in respect, not where there's a lot of other people around. So if you're that person that you hear something Zach said on Sunday and you're like, as soon as the service is over, I'm going right to him and I'm going to correct him, that's not how you're to do it. You're supposed to do it in love and respect with grace and you're supposed to do it to where it doesn't cause distraction or division or confusion among the body. Because here's the thing, if they would have done that with Apollo speaking, they would have maybe thrown out everything he said where that would have been foolish. So it's important that we, are, we have um, tact whenever we are instructing. So we need to listen, be open to instruction, and we also need to be tactful with the way that we give our instruction. So I think we see then that Christ, he makes us complete. We see that we are to listen to instruction. And then the final thing, and this is actually really the focus of what we read this morning before I, I came up to preach, and that is that our power comes from a relationship. More specifically, the power that we have access to comes from a relationship, an intimate connection to Christ. Our relationship is what gives us power and ability. And if you look in chapter 19, verses 11 to 12, it says that God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Just, can you just think how amazing Paul was able, or what amazing things Paul was able to do Literally, a handkerchief taken away from him. Long-distance miracles here, right? And literally, it just touches, and a person that was demon-possessed is healed. Someone that has cancer is healed. Blind, lame, all of these things are happening because Paul had a relationship with Christ. Paul believed what Jesus said at the Great Commission, Lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. He knew that Jesus 
was with him. And whenever he would preach the name of Christ, he understood that Christ holds every victory. There's nothing that can defeat Christ. See in the Bible, when you have people that love the Lord, are in a relationship with the Lord, and see what they are able to do, if you want to do amazing things for the kingdom, you need to make sure that you get your relationship with Christ right. You need to be abiding in Christ. And I think sometimes as Christians, we feel powerless, don't we? We don't, we don't see what's going on with Paul where he, he's doing amazing things with preaching and, and, and miracles and wonders, right? Sometimes we feel powerless in certain situations, but I think it's because we're not abiding in Christ. Now, once again, I'm not promising you go in devotion time today, you're going to start bringing people back from the dead. I'm not saying you're going to start doing some miracle working, right? Now, if God wants to give you that power, I'm not going to say, God, you can't do that. But what I am saying is you can do amazing, powerful things for the kingdom when you are abiding in Jesus. And I think sometimes, like I said, that the reason we aren't is because we're not spending time with him. We're not loving him. We're not relating to him. And it's kind of like this. It's like you, if you see this cross, it's plugged into a wall. It's plugged into a power source, right? The reason that we see the light is because it's connected. But the minute I unplug it, what happens? All of the power is gone. That doesn't mean that the power is not available. It's still there, but it's when you plug in. It's when you connect. It's when you abide. That's where our power comes from. And so many times, Christians, we aren't abiding. We aren't connecting to the source. Once again, he is the one that makes us complete. He has the fullness of God. He has the power to literally exercise demons, heal the sick, save people from the, from the spiritual death to life. I mean, he can do all of these things. And so many times we as Christians are just walking around like the rest of the world. You have the power of God that you can access through a relationship. We can do nothing without him, though. That's what John 15, 5 to 8 says. We can't rely on ourselves, our own power, our own wisdom. John 15, 5 to 8, it says, I am the vine. This is Jesus. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That is, you get to do some powerful things. You get to love people. You get to overcome temptation. You get to bring a little bit more of heaven to earth. You get to be over the spiritual powers of darkness. You get to love your neighbor, share the gospel. You get to do things for the kingdom, bear much fruit, but then it says, for without me, you can do nothing. See, you're not going to bear fruit. You're not going to have power. You're not going to make a difference if it's not in Christ, if you're not dependent on Christ. If you're trying to go through the motions of life by yourself, you're going to be powerless. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, so that's how you can abide. His words are abiding in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. It also says you can actually pray to God, and God's going to hear you, and he's actually going to move because of your relationship, of your abiding. But once again, if you don't, you have nothing. You are powerless, and that's what we see in the text in 19 verses 13 to 16. The seven sons of uh, Siva or Skiva, they were powerless before the demons. How embarrassing when they tried to show up using Jesus' name and had no relationship. You're going to be humbled very quickly when you try to say, I'm a Christian, say in Jesus' name, say, I'm praying for you, and you don't even know the one you're talking about. Because that's what the demons are going to say. They're going to say, who are you? You got nothing without Jesus. You are powerless, and you're going to find yourself naked, afraid, and beaten without Jesus. But in Jesus, we see what Paul could do, and we see time and time again what disciples can do when we abide in this powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. And the final thing I just want to draw from this is, in when we think about this power, it's not about trying to magnify ourselves. When I say power, I'm not saying, oh, make yourself amazing and cool. 
self-sufficient. No, what I'm saying is that we have this power given to us, but the purpose is to magnify Christ. That's what this message is entitled, Magnify Christ. And that's in uh, verses 17 to 20, that's what happens. The nation or the people of Ephesus, they see Paul, they see him preaching, they see what he does with his power, and they all say, Christ is magnified. We worship and praise Jesus, and we're going to give up all of our past. We're going to give up our, our spell books. We're going to give up all of our finances. We're going to give it to magnify Christ. That's what it means to be powered by the Spirit. It's where you magnify Christ with your life. And in fact, sometimes people are wondering, like, you know, why do we have the Holy Spirit, and, and what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, in John 15, 26, we see the purpose of his ministry. But when the Helper comes, when the, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, when Jesus sends the Helper, I shall send him to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, and what will he do? He will testify of me. The reason we have the Holy Spirit it's so that Christ is magnified. You have the Spirit of God living in you if you are a Christian follower. And you are able to do what the Holy Spirit has powered you to do. To magnify, glorify Christ. See, you can know very quickly if you have people filled with the Spirit in a room, because you can start asking the question, who's being magnified? Is it Christ? Then you see the Spirit there. That's why in this whole book, the theme is, be my witnesses. Magnify Christ, and that's what the Holy Spirit came to do. And so he can do it through you if you have a relationship and abide in him. Let us pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for instruction and correction, and we thank you for Paul's faithful witness that he would go and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, and that those who would receive it would be made complete in you because you are the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lord, the perfect Savior. And Lord, I pray that we would respond in, in repentance and faith to you, Lord, that we would believe in you, that we would seek the whole gospel message, that we would apply any correction to our life, Lord, and that we would find the power that we have been given through our relationship and abiding in you. When we, we root your word in our hearts and we, we have your spirit renewing our mind, we, we see that our purpose and power comes by magnifying Christ, making his name great, making him popular and famous to the world. We love you, we thank you, we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.